Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Now we're going to start with the first with a keynote speaker announced by Carlos. But before we do that, let me remind you of how we'll work. We're going to have time for questions at the end. For those of you in the room, uh, say, get close to the microphone, say who you represent, give your name. And those of you remotely, you can use uh, the uh, Q&A feature. Now, let me introduce Lee Howard, uh, Vice President Senior, um, who will of IP Global, who will talk about the influences in the deployment of IPv6. Uh, so I invite Lee Howard. Good morning. If that's okay. Um, if you need to take a minute to go get translation, then uh, go ahead. This is a good time. I also want to uh, uh, beg the pardon of the translators, because in the past I've spoken too quickly, and it's been a problem for them. I've promised to try to speak more slowly. Easier for people who don't speak my language as a native language. So my name is Lee Howard. I'm at IPv4.global by Hilco Stream Bank. We are an address broker. If you don't know me, you're wondering why is an IPv4 broker talking about IPv6? Uh, last week I was on a panel at Aaron about the, the called, why doesn't the internet move completely to IPv6? And it was, I thought it was a very good panel at Aaron. You can watch the YouTube video. Aaron has posted a blog post about uh, the, the highlights of the event. And, but I thought this week I'd talk a little bit more about why does the internet move to IPv6? What are the influences? How do people make that decision? I am gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that I think don't work, but, uh, but mostly I wanna talk about what, what does work. Why, why do people make this, this particular decision? So most people who've ever heard of IPv6 have seen this chart. This is the, the Google IPv6 chart that says uh, you know, how, how much of the internet, how, much, how many, what percentage of users reach Google over IPv6. Now, this is not just google.com or google.com.co or google.com, whatever. It's not just uh, Dot com. It's also not just Google, it includes YouTube and all of the Google's other properties. They push them all together and, uh, and, take <clears throat> and, and combine their, their access numbers. And it's, you know, it's a good story. It's, uh, we've got, we, we just hit 40%. That's fantastic. 40% of access to Google is now over IPv6. Uh, that, that's, that seems great. It's not quite that steep slope that we saw five years ago. Um, I was so, sort of hoping that would continue. But okay, so maybe we've done this little we talk about the S-curve of technology adoption, whether it's slow at first, and then steep, and then slow. It's, a, it's fairly linear now. In case you haven't seen this before, the, it's this very shaggy line. It's almost, it's, it's very bouncy. And what we see there is when people uh, go home, when they're using their mobile devices, most of the access is over IPv6, so the number is at the high end of the range. When people go to work during the week, the number comes down because lots of businesses, and I'm talking about corporate offices, enterprises, have not deployed IPv6 into, in their IT department. And so, uh, so, so they don't use Google over IPv6 at work. You can see that a little bit in some of these places where the numbers sort of condense, where it's a little thinner. During the pandemic, people weren't going to the office. They were at home or they were on mobile. And so the bottom of the line there wasn't as low. And so you, it gets much thinner. And then as people returned, it's sort of, it, it has been returning to the normal ups and downs. I don't know why everybody uses this particular chart, though, because this chart is just eyes. It's just eyeballs looking at Google, and, and doesn't, which is a very small part of the IPv6 story. We can compare other, other networks. This particular one is, this is Facebook, and it's about the same, 35%. That's worldwide. And you can go to any of these sites, and they'll, tell, they'll give you numbers for any individual country. So still, it's a similar kind of curve, still good. Uh, Facebook is, is accessed more over mobile than, than maybe Google is. And here we have um, a couple of other uh, charts. Maybe it's more interesting, rather than looking at one individual uh, content provider's assessment of what the internet looks like over IPv6, let's look by country. So we have here two different sources of data. On the right, I mentioned Facebook. You can go in and drill down into uh, more detail on which countries are, are accessing Facebook over IPv6. And on the other side, you can see I've got, uh, uh, which this is uh, actually 
Jeff Houston at APNIC has been providing this experiment for a few years now, uh, where he's showing some statistics about which countries have the, the highest deployment of IPv6 as far as, as far as he can tell. It's a very interesting experiment. He, um, he, he buys uh, search keywords like cats and the internet, uh, very general terms, and he says, so if I give you this URL in an ad that Google serves and you come to my, my server to, see, to, to look at that ad, to see, just to display that ad, do you see it over IPv4 or over IPv6? So he can see the percentage that's IPv6 capable. It eventually returns the, or, or asks for the IPv6 image. He can also see how much is preferred it, that IPv6 is pulled first. And it's very interesting. It's very different than it was a few years ago. India, number one, highest deployment of IPv6 on a, on a percentage basis. Uh, Jeff says 77%, and uh, uh, Facebook shows uh, 68%. I've got some more detail in a minute. Uh, Belgium, Malaysia, uh, United States, uh, Saudi Arabia, Montserrat. So quite a mix of countries, too. It's not all the US. It's not all Europe. It's all around the world. And, it, and I've got the top, I think, a oh, couple dozen here. So it's, it's lots of different countries. It's, it's, a, it's a much broader story than it ever used to be. Well, that's good. Let's look into it. It's a little more interesting, though, to look at the individual networks. Because countries don't make decisions as, as, as individuals. Really, it's somebody at a company makes a decision that that network is going to deploy IPv6. And so when you, I mentioned India was, was uh, at the top of the country list on both of those country lists. Well, here's why. Reliance Geo uh, deployed IPv6. 93, almost 94% of, of, IP, of uh, users in, on Reliance Geo access the internet of various different uh, content providers over IPv6. Now, this is from ISOC's, thank you, ISOC. This is from ISOC's uh, IPv6, uh, World IPv6 Launch Measurements page. So the, the URL's there at the bottom. You can go there. It's, um, it, it, it's actually an, a combination of um, Facebook, Google, Akamai, I forget who else, all provide numbers to ISOC, and they combine those numbers to provide these. And it's an interesting way of relating with the relative strength of each, of each ISP. What's especially interesting is the ranking here, I think, because you can see the percentages on the right are not in order of highest to lowest. This is, they're in order of most IPv6 users to least IPv6 users. And this is voluntary. There may be networks that aren't on this list. If you think you should be on this list, go contact ISOC, and there's a URL on the page that you can do, and they will happily add you to the list and will be delighted to to, uh, to include your numbers in the report. So Reliance is, is, is number one, not because they have 94%, but because they have 400 million users. And so of those, 94% of their access is over IPv6. Similarly, Comcast, with all of their ASNs there, at 71% isn't as high as, as say, uh, charter communication, as AT&T or T-Mobile, but they just have more users using IPv6. That's why they're higher. So it's a sort of relative impact on the world of IPv6 is kind of the ranking here. OK, so now you can see sort of where I'm coming from and why I'm going to look at some of the countries and some of the companies that I'm going to look at and talk about what were their influences uh, on the deployment of IPv6. And really what I wanted to do was tell some stories, because I think that stories are more motivating than numbers, for some of us, at least. So Reliance Geo. Uh, Oh, I looked it up. I can't remember the name of the, the guy who founded it. Reliance is this very, very large multinational corporation. Has uh, operations in, in quite a few countries. I think they're the largest retailer in India, among other things. And uh, they said, we want to create a mobile network, a, a mobile carrier that can carry, that, that can provide service to everyone in the country. Which means we need to have a handset that costs less than $10. And we need to make sure that we can price our service so that everybody can afford it. And in fact, they said we, they're gonna start off with free. For the first six months after they launched the service, it didn't cost anything to use the service. There's no way that you can provide a service for free when IPv4 addresses cost $50 a piece, right? The, the cost, your, your costs are just too high. 
obviously eventually they had to charge something in order to cover the costs of the network that they've built. And they built this enormous network around India. Uh, you know, national network was, was, uh, was a new thing there. And you can see that this growth rate, when you, when you provide a service for free and a handset for $10 equivalent, $10 US, in one month, they went from zero subscribers to 16 million subscribers. I don't think anybody in this room could grow that fast without IPv6. That would be a wonderful story. And in, in, in three months, three months, they got to 50 million subscribers. And now, of course, part of the reason that they're so high on that, on that uh, previous chart is that they have 400 million subscribers. Now, they do have some IPv4. You have to have IPv4 in order to reach all of the internet that doesn't speak IPv6. And I'm going to come back to some of the internet that maybe doesn't speak IPv6. But, but it's all in translation. Everything they do as much as possible is over IPv6. It's a strong preference. The chart that I've included here is it doesn't look like the traditional you know, skyrocketing growth chart that we're used to seeing on those, those really exciting days. But that's because the really important part is the part on the very, very left there. And that was their first launch. The, the, really hard to see from the back, and I apologize. A lot of my slides include uh, screenshots from parts of the internet, and that means that the fonts are very, very small. But so the, uh, the first couple of horizontal lines are uh, number of subscribers in millions. And so it's 100 million, 200 million, 300 million, 400 million. So to go in quarter by quarter from zero to 100 million in, uh, in less than a year is, is just amazing. And of course, they did that because they could provide this free service and they were able to challenge all of the other mobile carriers in India. That, that's fantastic. Of course, with what now they're providing a, a 25 or 30% of, of people in India are with Reliance Geo. No way they could have done that with IPv4. TM, also, TMNet, also known as Unify, is one of the, uh, Malaysia was one of the top countries. And so I wanted to go look at, all right, how did that happen? What was the story in Malaysia? It's actually kind of a similar story in some ways. So Telecom Malaysia launched a, 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 a new internet access. They'd been around for a little while. They were sort of um, encouraged by the, the Malaysia government. Um, in 2018, they launched their Fiber to the Home project. Before that, they'd been doing uh, DSL and, um, and, and dial-up, and ISDN, I think. So, and, and they had a little bit of deployment. <clears throat> but um, the government of Malaysia had identified IPv6 as a strategic need, not because they're necessarily so forward-looking and love technology. I mean, maybe. I mean, who doesn't love technology? But because they said the, the, we need access uh, to the internet for everybody in Malaysia. How do we get access to everybody in Malaysia? Well, so they said to TMNet, go build this fiber to the home network. Go enable IPv6. And we will fund, I think it was about 25% of your costs for deploying IPv6 if you hit certain milestones. So it's, you must have a certain number of users, you must have a certain amount of access, um, those milestones as they went. And they, they had to be externally verifiable. So that's one of the few examples of a really good public-private partnership that I've seen for IPv6 deployment. And, and to be fair to the, the Malaysian government, they also had created the, um, uh, the National Advanced Center for IPv6 uh, in 2005. So they've been, been laying the groundwork for a while. They created a mandate two years ago that said all consumer electronics must support IPv6 uh, for access in, in Malaysia. So some very strong support from the Malaysian government uh, that eventually, of course, led to this, these kinds of deployment numbers. But I think really what really makes, makes sense, why the Malaysian government cared and why TMNet was so successful, again, they were targeting homes with less than $1,000 a month in income. So $1,000 a month is, it's a, moderate income in Malaysia. But if that's your entire income, you don't have a lot of money to spend on handsets and internet access. So they were trying to make sure that they were providing a very low cost service that could then disrupt all of the other providers and sort of increase the level of internet deployment throughout the country. And there we go. They're up at, uh, so shortly after they launched their fiber to the home service, the IPv6 uptake uh, went up very quickly. And they're now at something like 60% of um, and this is, by the way, the whole country, that those, the number on the bottom there, the red and blue lines. So 60% of the entire country now has IPv6, partly based on the leadership of, of, telecom, of, uh, of TMNet. So, okay, so 
part of what we see is that is, is cost is definitely a driving factor. I've got one more large company, T-Mobile. T-Mobile was um, a new cellular phone carrier in the US. We had three incumbents, uh, AT&T, Verizon, and Sprint. And T-Mobile came along and said, we think we can do it better. But the important thing is, we need to do it cheaper. We can build the best network. But in order for people, in order for us to compete, we also need to be a cheaper network, cheaper service than our competitors are providing. So they were one of the original participants in World IPv6 Day and World IPv6 Launch. Can you believe World IPv6 Launch was 10 years ago next month? 10 years. So when they participated in World IPv6 Launch, they had already deployed IPv6 really to, to their users. What they found was that when content moved to IPv6, they instantly saw half of all of their traffic move to IPv6. T-Mobile was spending a lot of money on, NAT, on CGN, on NAT boxes, carrier grade network address translation. They were spending a lot of money on that, and they said, we need to drive this cost out of our network. Well, we can't get enough addresses to handle the millions of people that we want to serve, so how are we going to do it? We're going to deploy IPv6. And so they cut the cost of that translation in half. Now, it seems to me that regardless of whether that device is a router that's already in your network or uh, a bunch of dedicated uh, custom-built hardware, that it's going to cost something. And if you can reduce the costs of your infrastructure by 50%, that's probably going to let you uh, lower your prices and be more competitive. So they went from, so this, the World IPv6 launch was in uh, 2012. And, sorry, I, I got confused. Not June 2022, June 2012. And you can see they went from uh, 50 customer, that's customer contracts in thousands. So they went from 50,000 almost overnight, something from about 30,000 almost overnight, they went, uh, got up to uh, 30, 40, 50,000, and then just an increasing slope of growth uh, over time, partly because they're able to keep their costs down. Okay, so there's one reason I mean, for three different, very, very different kinds of networks and, and decision processes. That's one reason that people would choose to deploy IPv6. That's one major influence. Here's another example of, of a government being involved. So two colleagues, Eric Vinke and uh, Gunter van der Velt in, uh, in Belgium, were talking to some of the, to the telecom regulator and the federal police and uh, investigators in the country. And, they, and the, the, the government was very concerned if people are deploying NAT, this came up on the panel this morning too, right? If people are deploying NAT, how are we going to catch criminals? How are we going to catch terrorists? We've got people who are hiding behind, who are doing terrible things on the internet. Terrible things. And we can't find them because when we show up at an ISP and say, who was using this IPv4 address? The ISP says, I don't know, a thousand people were using that address. Or a hundred people were using that address. Or whatever the number is. And so the regulator said, we have to, we, this is not possible. We have to completely ban NAT altogether. It's not allowed in our country anymore. And, and the mobile carriers and the ISPs in Belgium said, w what? You, you can't do that. <laughs> we have to have NAT. We can't get more IPv4 addresses. How is that going to work? It's going to completely change the competitive landscape in the country if new uh, companies, if new entrants need to buy IPv4 addresses. It's going to change how we architect our network. It's going to ch it's the, the costs are going to be uh, just astronomical. So the regulator said, well, you can't just do nothing. And so they came up with a compromise. And the compromise was that the ISPs said, tell you what, we'll keep it under 16 users per IPv4 address, and you won't lock us up. And the regulator said, OK, that's, that, that's a good compromise. They, they argued about what the number was, 16, 64, 100. They argued about what the number should be, and they, they decided on 16. And so they said, the, the rule still stands. You can't use NAT, but we won't arrest you. We, we won't sue you. We won't take you to jail if your NAT is less than 16 users per address, because at that point, the police can say, OK, I've only got 16 people I have to go through. I can look at other information and figure out who, the other, who those people are, and I can generally figure out which door it is that I want to come down and, and, and beat down. And so that happened, and again, fairly quickly, 
That, that was about 2013, 2014. Fairly quickly, the ISPs held their part of the bargain and started deploying IPv6. Because again, the only way they could avoid using more NAT was more IPv6. And so they, they've topped out around 55%. There's a recent spike to 65%. I hope that's real. Probably a statistical anomaly, the sort of thing that you see whenever you see live data. So that's pretty good. That's, you know, they, they, they went up quickly. Remains to be seen where the rest of the, of the country goes. But another reason they were, the regulators were involved and, but let the ISPs come up with the, with the right compromise. Okay. I've talked a lot about um, the eyeball networks. But again, let's start, I started off with, but that's only part of the internet. There's this whole World Wide Web, and that's content that those people are trying to get to. So what are they trying to reach? Well, so in each country, there's a different set of most important websites. And so again, Eric Vinke, who I mentioned before, he's provided some, some measurements for us. And these are, these are fantastic. I, I recommend going to his, his page. He provides measurements for us on uh, how many, in this case, how many of the top 50 websites in each country supports IPv6? How many have a, really, he's measuring, do they have a quad A? Does something, does the quad A work? And so that's good. He actually even goes further and says, he's got some data, and I think it comes from some name servers that he's polling. He's got some data that says, well, it's not just, those top 50 websites aren't all equally important. The number one website is probably more important than the number 50 website. More people go to it. So he does a little bit of weighting. He multiplies how many times people go to the number one website and how many times people go to the number 50 website and, and on through. And so that's how he does that. That's the, the weighting column. So for Colombia, number one, for, number of webs for the top 50 websites, Colombia has more of their top 50 websites supporting IPv6 than any other country in the world. That's fantastic. It's really exciting that it happens to be true today while we're here. What's even more interesting to me is it wasn't true yesterday. Yesterday, I ran, the, I uh, created this, 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 I updated this slide, and I looked at it, and I looked at the couple of different countries, and I went, well, I'd like to use something, a, a local example, and uh, and I think I came up with Azerbaijan was number one, and but so Colombia, fantastic, way to go! I'm so excited to be here. So according to uh, uh, Eric's. Uh, math, he says, so I've, uh, over there on the right, 30, you can see on the, on the, the right column, 34 of the top 50 websites in Colombia support IPv6. That's pretty good, that's 68%. Now it seems that the top 10 websites may not have as much support because when you weight it, um, it's, it's lower than, than, uh, than 68%, only 51% of the traffic you want to see. Of the 58, the, the way to say it is, 51.81% of the websites that you want to get to have IPv6. And of course, you can go on down the list, and, and Iceland, Norway, Netherlands, Liechtenstein. Um, again, it's around the world kind of, kind of story here, which is good. But why? So what is it about Colombia that is so good? And so part of it is, uh, actually, I just want another I wanted to double check my numbers, make sure it's actually consistent. This is um, worldwide IPv6 websites that support IPv6. Um, again, Eric's uh, page, and this is uh, about 30% worldwide of all websites. Actually, it's kind of funny that 30% of websites worldwide and 30 some percent, nearly 40% of eyeballs support IPv6. That's actually a closer number than it has been in a while. And it's a nice up and to the right kind of number. Love to see those. Do one more validation on this is the top 1,000 uh, websites, according to Alexa, Alexa ranks websites by their popularity. The top 1,000 websites uh, that support IPv6, this is provided, I believe it's a measurement provided by Comcast, and again, it's on the ISOC World IPv6 Launch Measurements website. And so again, it's in the 30%. Uh, the time frame is shorter, so it doesn't show quite the slope that, that you might hope to see, but it's still, you know, it, 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 it's pretty good, it's in the right direction. So why? So here's one country with high IPv6 content, and, and again, Eric Vinke's website, fantastic. I've got the top 10 websites in Colombia. And 
the, uh, the middle column there is whether the website supports IPv6 or not. If it's green, it does. And if it's red, it does not. Fairly obvious. But so what we see is uh, of the top 10, only half actually support IPv6. Hmm. Why is that? Well, if I look on the right, this is a hint. It's not certain, but this is a hint. If your website is hosted or is, is uh, provided service by Cloudflare, Cloudflare number one, IPv6. Number five, uh, Cloudflare, IPv6. Number seven, or number, excuse me, number eight, Cloudflare, IPv6, IPv6, IPv6. If Cloudflare is providing service to you, you have IPv6. OK, well, why don't the others? Well, again, it's a hint. I don't know. But looking at the DNS provider, AWS, Amazon Web Services. So number two website is hosted on AWS. Doesn't have IPv6. I'm going to talk more about AWS in a few minutes, but it's not, you don't automatically get IPv6 when you're on AWS. Uh, Cloud DNS, uh, no. The other one that's not shown here, do I have this? Yep. So here's another example. This is, where am I? Ecuador, one of the lower countries on the, on the list for IPv6 content. And part of what we see is no, no Cloudflare at all. Number one is Google. But I actually see this in lots of countries where the top websites are hosted by Google. And so if Google is providing your, your email, your DNS, and your web hosting, then you probably have IPv6. And that provides, and we've seen a lot of small countries where Google is much of the infrastructure being provided in that country, and therefore there's a lot of IPv6 on their websites. Again, the ones that don't, lots of AWS. So one of the things I'm pointing out here is if you have an infrastructure, a web front end provider that automatically gives you IPv6, like Cloudflare, you have IPv6. You don't even have to make a decision in that case, uh, unlike if you have uh, AWS. Now let me, let, let me talk about Amazon Web Services for a minute. So Amazon, one of the things that people always ask me is, will the cost, the price of IPv4 addresses affect the deployment of IPv6. So far, I haven't seen a clear correlation. So uh, companies that sell IPv4 addresses, many of them don't deploy IPv6 because they had a surplus of IPv4 addresses, so they didn't feel any need to, but not a strong percentage. Companies that buy IPv4 addresses. So Amazon has bought 114 million, almost 115 million IPv4 addresses. That's according to the public RIR transfer logs. I looked it up yesterday and looked at how much addresses cost um, in each year that they bought those addresses, and I don't know what Amazon paid. That's, you know, and even if I did, I couldn't tell you. But um, I know what prices were on average each year for the past 10 years, 11 years. And so if I multiply that out, Amazon may well have spent $2 billion US on IPv4 addresses. That seems like a fair amount of incentive to deploy IPv6. And in fact, if I go look at some of their competitor cloud services, Google, Microsoft, Azure, Oracle, um, the, the sort of the, the largest big name companies that got into cloud as a separate line of business, Amazon's support for IPv6 on their services is much better. That's an opinion. That's a qualitative assessment. I have not figured out how do I measure how much of Amazon's services support IPv6, and I can't compare it very well because Amazon has one list of, of services and Google has a different list of services. But when I look at the other cloud providers, they've got two or three or four different things you can do with IPv6. That says you can publish a quad A record and get to a website, but all of the infrastructure stuff on the cloud is still going to be over IPv4 compared to uh, Amazon, where there's an awful lot of things that you can do with IPv6 on the AWS cloud. But it's not on automatically. You have to decide that you want to enable it. You have to go find the right buttons for it. And in most cases, you can't do IPv6 only. You still have to use their IPv4 addresses. They do have their bring your own IP service, 
Um, I've used it. It's, um, you'd better be comfortable with the command line. Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit tricky. You can't do it through the console, not yet. Um, but it works. You can publish your addresses to be announced through their ASN, and, and it works you know, when, once you get there. So there are different ways that you can do that, but we're still not all the way there. Again, I don't want to say too strongly that Amazon hasn't done their work. They're making great progress. The one thing I'd like to see from them is Amazon.com would be nice to see over IPv6. OK, so uh, where else can we go? Um, other reasons, this is from a presentation I did two or three years ago at Nanog. And I, it was called Prisoner of IPv4. And I was looking at what are, again, part of the presentation was what are the reasons that people deploy IPv6. And, and I came to, you know, IPv6 is faster than IPv4. And when I tell people that, many of them say, you're a liar, or you don't know what you're talking about, or it tests exactly the same in the lab, IPv6 and IPv4. And I say, well, that's great. I've done some more research on it. I think the reason in general is that uh, your, your laptop speaks IPv4 and IPv6 equally well, just the same. Your home network, just the same. Your handset is, if it's Apple, the app is required to support IPv6 natively, or at least to support NAT64. And that's been a requirement for, I think, five years in the Apple App Store. Uh, Android said, we can't, we don't have that kind of power over app developers in Android. So they said, we need to create a software shim, an insert layer uh, between IPv4 and the network in case an app is using uh, either a, 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 a literal IPv4 address or is using a, uh, or, or is going to an, an IPv4 only website. So, and for some reason, won't work over IPv6 or over NAT64. I think that software layer that Android, that Google wrote for Android, adds some latency because it's doing translation in a phone in software. Yeah, that sounds like the, rewriting every packet, that sounds like that could add some latency. So as best I can tell, I haven't been able to re reproduce the experiment. If somebody wants to, I think it would be a fantastic scholarly paper. Do the research, run the experiment, compare the two. I'll bet you'll find that on average, um, Android is 15% slower than, um, than Apple. And I think that you'll find probably 20 milliseconds for web page load times. So I went to these big content providers and I said, well, what's, does a millisecond of data of latency matter? Does 20 milliseconds of latency matter? And I found that some people think it does. Amazon said every 100 milliseconds of latency costs 1% in sales. Think of this number of sales Amazon makes on Amazon.com. How much money is that? Akamai says 100 millisecond delay hurt conversion time by 7%. That means people didn't click the thing that you wanted them to click. That's directly tied to revenue. And of course, Google said that the traffic and revenue um, from searchers dropped by 20% when the delay, when, uh, delay increased. Half a, so half a second of delay caused a 20% drop in traffic. If you run a website, an e-commerce site, any kind of platform where speed matters, where people will abandon the site, will bounce if, they, if the site loads slowly, this, is, this speed is really important. And oh, by the way, Google's search rankings, if you want to be found on your website, when somebody Googles a special term, Google includes as part of its search rankings, not just whether you support IPv6, but how fast your page loads. Google collects that data from Android data. So if your website doesn't support IPv6, your SEO is going to be lower because your site is, is loading slower than the next, the next company's site who loads over IPv6. Well, so that's a pretty good incentive, sales. If you could increase your sales by one or 10% or 20%, just by deploying IPv6, you might give serious consideration to doing that. There's a whole, again, um, in that prisoner of IPv4 uh, talk, there's a whole section where I go into the, the actual d uh, data and the numbers that are related there. Okay, so now I wanted to get into 
some of the other countries where, where um, what are the other reasons, the other influences on IPv6 deployment? This is, uh, I'm going, kind of going back to the eyeball networks because that seems to be where a lot of people put their emphasis. The country of Belarus in uh, 20, I think it was 2017, uh, maybe it was 2018, said by January of 2020, all ISPs in Belarus will have to enable IPv6 support on all customer connections. That was by 2020, everything will be over IPv6. Well, 10% is not 100%, but I will say that they came out with that announcement and shortly after the start of 2020, a lot more ISPs started turning on the IPv6 switch. And so IPv6 was enabled for a lot more users. And that's a very steep slope, relatively speaking. So it went from 0 to 4% in a few weeks, and then to 7% in a year. And now we're over 10%, and it's, and it's going in the right direction. So that's good. And, and Belarus has had some other distractions uh, in the past couple of years. So I can understand why maybe some of the ISPs and maybe the regulators lost a little bit of focus on enforcing this. Um, there have been a couple of things going on in the past two years, but uh, to see it that, um, that steep is great. This is the first time I've ever seen a, a, court, a, a, a national mandate, you will support IPv6, have any direct measurable effect, except China, probably including China. So China had a mandate that by the end of 2013, essentially 1% of users in China would be running IPv6. And um, so the uh, top number on the right there is 1.2%. Um, in roughly June, July of 2012, they hit 1%. And in August of 2013, they hit 1.2%. And in December of 2013, they hit 1.2%. I don't see it. I don't see anything indicating that 1% of users were running IPv6 in China on, uh, by the end of the year, in, by the end of 2013. I, I see that they were for a day or two, maybe a week, and then they stopped. I don't know why. Um, it's, I have some speculation. I've been, I've been told that um, China did a good job of funding the IPv6 transition among the three major carriers in China. They gave them a lot of money, and the carriers said, thank you very much. And then we saw this. Um, but I don't, but part of it is it is difficult to measure from outside China. It's difficult to measure what's going on inside China because of their architecture. So we don't really know, but there was nothing to see here. However, again, I want to be fair. It's uh, eight years later, and uh, they have a new mandate. Enable IPv6 to 20% of users by the end of 2018, 50% by 2020, and 100% by 2025. Well, they haven't, they've made it to 20%. And 20% in China is 200 million users. That's, that's not nothing. That's a lot of people using IPv6. But they made it in um, January of this year. So they're about four years behind. Maybe that's just the way mandates work. I don't know. Uh, I, I kind of go back to how do you influence IPv6 deployment. The, the best example of government involvement that I've seen was um, back when I was talking about um, Malaysia and Belgium, where it was a public-private partnership, where the government convened the ISPs and said, how can we make this happen? Is this, a, is this something we need to do? Um, I will also say, I haven't mentioned the United States at all. Um, I will say that the one thing that, the, and a lot of people pointed to the, the United States mandates for IPv6 and have said those are government mandates, but they're not. They're, they're internal mandates where the government has said, we will run IPv6. And they haven't succeeded very well. They didn't have great, the earliest ones did not have great support from within the US government. And so, so people would, do, would, would write a plan saying, we'll do IPv6 eventually, or all of the equipment we've bought supports IPv6. It may only support one kilobit per second of IPv6 traffic on a 100 gig port. I've seen that. It may only support um, manually configured IPv6 addresses. It may only support you know, all of the things that say 
the vendor checked the box when we said when we asked does it support IPv6. So it didn't do much there. The one thing it did do is when the US government went to a data center or an ISP and said, we must have IPv6, they eventually got the data center, the ISP, to enable IPv6, which meant the next company. That we, when, when the private sector came in to deploy IPv6, it was easier for them. I did a study a few years ago, private study, I haven't, haven't published it, showing for a Caribbean country, um, what would happen if they deployed IPv6 internally? They didn't. Um, but it looked to me like they could localize all of their traffic within the country instead of offshoring to data centers on, in the mainland US. Why would you want your government websites hosted in Los Angeles when your country is a Caribbean island nation? So I, I, I hope that they, uh, they will do something there soon. OK, here's my summary. First, providers who want to provide service cheaply, who want to grow by being the best, lowest cost carrier, as best I can tell, you have to do IPv6. And that's what we saw over and over with those, those upstart ISPs, uh, T-Mobile, Reliance Geo, TMNet, even though TMNet was the incumbent, uh, all of them said, we want to get to a huge percentage of the users in our, in our country. And so they deployed IPv6 to reduce their costs. And those are, the, those are the networks that have grown fastest. For content, you have to be with a host that will turn IPv6 on by default. And that could be Cloudflare. It could be, could be, I didn't describe, some people may think that I'm only talking about large companies. I didn't talk about Mythic Beasts, a very small uh, hosting company in the UK that decided they wanted to use Raspberry Pi instead of, you know, big fat 1U servers, they wanted to use Raspberry Pis to, uh, to host web services. You get your very own hardware dedicated to you, but the device costs $20. Are you gonna put a $50 IP address on $20 worth of hardware? It doesn't make any sense. So they're IPv6 only. You can't get to those devices over IPv4. They do provide some proxy services, uh, but, they're, but it's, it's all native IPv6 only. So hosting IPv6 on by default, IPv6 is better, this again, where the influence is, IPv6 is better for engagement, keeping people on your website because the performance is good, keeping people uh, serving more ads. If you're running a content site, that's where the revenue is generated based on the number of ads you serve. The longer people are there, the more ads they see, the more money you make. And of course, that search engine optimization, making it higher in the Google rankings. IPv6 might not be first, but it's on the list. And finally, the public-private partnerships seem to work better than simply government mandates from the top down saying you will do IPv6. Those are my conclusions. I would be happy to talk about uh, questions, uh, comments, uh, other people's stories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Would you like to talk to her? Okay. Bueno, muchas gracias, Lee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. Yes, round for applause, of applause for Lee. So we'll now go to the Q&A session. Please remember that you can go up to the microphone if you have questions for Lee. And also, remote participants can ask questions in the Q&A box. I'm going to ask Jorge Villa of the two FTL. Are there any questions for Lee? Hi. Questions? We have no remote questions so far. Is there anyone in the room who would like to ask Lee Howard a question? Don't miss this opportunity. We have a top-level speaker with us today, and we have to take advantage of that opportunity. Any questions for Lee? Here we have the gentleman. You can ask your question in Spanish or English. You have interpretation. Good morning, everyone. I'm Cesar Martinez. I represent the regulator in Paraguay, and I would like to ask a question on IPv6 and the success stories that you have in the implementation regarding cybersecurity. 
this regarding implementing instead of the NAT for the purpose of controlling and cybersecurity, and what success stories do you have in that context? It seems to me that I haven't seen cases where people are where eyeball ISP networks or mobile carriers deploy IPv6 for security. That's not a primary reason for them. Um, in the case Nothing. of web hosts, content providers, websites, they do seem to use IPv6 sometimes. That's one of their higher considerations. Uh, Deutsche Telekom has a, a network design that includes very clearly segmented networks, and part of the reason they use IPv6 is so that those networks have a, uh, a, a cleaner separation uh, between them. Um, but of course, it's the Belgium example that's the clearest case of uh, the, the regulator saying we need to avoid, we, we need to make sure that discovery works better, that we can find the bad guys um, who are uh, using it. There was, there was an RFC at the IETF, oh, eight years ago, I think. I don't remember the number. Best, best practices for CGN, and it included logging. So if you run a website and you, you need to log not just the IP address, but the port number and a timestamp so that if you get a, a legal request, you can, re you can say, here's, here's who is using, uh, here's who is accessing our site by address and port number so they can go serve the ISP or mobile carrier who are using, uh, uh, who, 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 and show them the, the, all the information necessary to look into their NAT logs. Uh, that said, uh, there was somebody this morning from, I think, Spam House, uh, security considerations this morning. I know some people have concerns about IPv6 security, uh, that, that fighting spam is harder because of the reputation uh, considerations. How do, you, how do you block IP addresses when you have 340 trillion trillion addresses uh, to, to block? Um, it's not necessarily as hard as I think some people make it out to be. You just block the, the, the slash 64 and maybe, maybe have a lower, repu uh, a, a, a softer reputation score for the adjacent slash 64s. The numbers will help bear them out. Um, but mostly the, the tools there are still catching up to IPv4. Mo other security tools, firewalls, reporting, um, uh, uh, intrusion prevention systems, seem to have pretty good IPv6 support. I'm glad I can say that now. They did not seem that way uh, 10 years ago. It's a very good question. Okay. We have a remote question. And we have a remote question asked by Jordi Pallet. He says, the difference in performance in between iOS, iOS and Android. Can you explain that a, a bit more? Uh, OK, he said also, I was testing only between IPv4 and IPv6, and the reason for the 4 year percent was due to NAT44 and NAT444 plus translation to IPv6 when the data center is IPv6 only, such as Facebook. Okay, that's his question. So I think, hi, Jordi. Um, I think it, it, I, the policy forum hasn't started yet, and we'll, uh, we'll be hearing from Jordi a lot more. The, uh, I, I think that what happens is uh, when, um, when, uh, uh, when the handset is trying to get to uh, an IPv4 only website, um, if the intervening network is IPv6 only, then you have to do 464 XLAT or something like that, of course. And so those are the cases where uh, if, if the handset has to participate in software, then it's going to take longer to get there. Uh, if it's native IPv6 the whole way, then it will be faster. I haven't seen, but I, let's, this, this would probably be a great uh, topic for, for the, an operators group or some other exchange. I haven't seen uh, data suggesting that, uh, so, so NAT444 may introduce the same kind of problem, uh, but I, I haven't seen it in, in a NAT64 or, or, uh, uh, or a native IPv6 context. Um, but you know, we, should, we should look into it some more. I haven't seen NAT44, I've, I have not seen a carrier grade NAT introduce more latency than uh, whether it's NAT 4.4, NAT 6.4, or, 
or, uh, or, or, the, or the transition mechanism. They, they look the same to me in latency as far as the testing I've seen. But uh, I'm just, I've only seen what I've seen. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, have more questions? El caballero tenía una última pregunta. The gentleman had a question. Good morning. I'm Diego Sanchez. I'm from Ecuador. I represent Horizon Tel. In some of your slides, we saw that Ecuador had lesser content published in IPv6 compared to other countries in the region. I would like to know more in terms of your experience, what would be advisable? Although it is quite true we have limited content in the internet on IPv6, it would be advisable to think about a design conceived on a full deployment that is IPv6 native specifically, or could we also consider a hybrid deployment where we could have on the border IPv6 and in the inside would have translation IPv4. That is my question. Thank you. Uh, it, it, my answer, and it, but it's only, but other people I know, other people disagree with me. My answer is you can use whatever technology inside your data center that you want to use. You want to have IPv6 at the border. Um, I've seen uh, several architectural diagrams describing we have generally one-to-one -one NAT64 at the edge. So we've got load balancers doing, uh, providing service, providing the translation, so there's IPv6 at the edge, and there's private IPv4 inside the network, and the performance is fine. I, I've also seen another architecture that works well, Cloudflare, all they do is, is cache your data in their systems uh, around their network, and they automatically, when they do that, so they're drawing, they may pull your website over IPv4, but they'll serve it over IPv4 and IPv6. I, I didn't include this chart, but uh, Cloudflare famously enabled IPv6 for all of their customers. And when you can see the, the number of websites supporting IPv6, and then Cloudflare suddenly turned on IPv6 for all of their customers, the number of websites supporting IPv6 went like that. Uh, pretty incredible. That said, there's an argument for architectural purity. That is, if you do IPv6, natively inside the data center, it's easier in the long run. That's what Facebook does, that's what LinkedIn does. I have a friend in security at Facebook who said, some days I forget IPv4 even exists. I don't touch IPv4 anymore because all of my work is inside the network. All I ever see is IPv6 addresses. I, obviously you can reach Facebook over IPv4, but that's because they have translators at their edge Providing, act, providing IPv4 access to all of their internal systems. And, and LinkedIn, similarly, they do, the, uh, they do that as well. I think both of those are examples, by the way, where they were motivated not so much by the cost of IPv4 addresses or legal reasons. I think both of them said, um, we want people to stay on our social network longer because the more engagement we have, the longer people are on our site, the more money we make. That's, that's better, that we're, we're serving, we're gathering more data, we're serving better ads. Um, so. The, the fast and easy way is Cloudflare. The architecturally pure way is native IPv6 inside the data center. I don't think there's a very wrong answer. I think any of those will work. Oh, I've got one other story. I talked to somebody at CZNIC, the, um, and not at CZNIC, but somebody in the Czech Republic um, who ran a large hosting service there. And I said, this is years ago now, and I said, wow, you have a, why does Czechia have so much IPv6 deployment on content in the, in the country? And he said, because I run the largest hosting company in the country and I decided we were gonna provide IPv6 for all of our websites. So if there's one data center can just enable it for all of their customers, you get a significant amount of de deployment that way. Okay. Eh. Estamos ya sin tiempo. Well, we've run out of time. No more time. Please, if you have a question, you can ask Lee afterwards in the corridor. So you could ask Lee later because it's time already.